Thanks, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, so I'm going to keep this brief. My name's uh, Mike Becker. I'm a orga uh, organizer along with uh, my co-organizer Patrick O'Brien of uh, Data Philly. And uh, if anyone is interested in helping to uh, chip in to for, for uh, the, the fees that we pay to uh, to meet up, there's a chip in uh, link on the meetup page. So uh, you know any. Any donations that are that are made will will go towards uh, meetup fees. And I wanted to uh, uh, obviously thank Wharton um, for for hosting us here and for providing pizza. And we'll ha have a bit more from th from them in a minute. But uh, I want to hand first hand things off to uh, Sarah from GeoPhilly. Thanks. Um, so I'm from GeoPhilly. Um, if you guys aren't already a member of GeoPhilly, I'd recommend you check out our meetup page. Um, this event's co-hosted with Data Philly and GeoPhilly. Uh, so GeoPhilly does events around geospatial data and mapping, and we have a lot of really awesome stuff coming up in the spring. Uh, we have an event at Temple University <clears throat> in March. We have an event next week, actually, um, a collaboration with the city of Philadelphia working on a project related to litter. And um, we're doing a balloon mapping event during Philly Tech Week. Um, and we also have some events planned in May with um, the Philly Python user group and in June with Map Time. So we have a lot of awesome stuff coming up. So if you're not already a member of GeoPhilly, definitely check it out. And I also want to let everyone know about a fellowship program that we run at Azavia. So if you um, have a geospatial background um, and you are currently enrolled in an academic program, check out um, summerofmaps.com. We um, give students uh, $5,000 fellowships to work on pro bono projects over the summer and get mentorship from um, Azavia staff. So definitely check that out. And um, I think that's all I've got to say about GeoPhilly. Um, but I'd like to introduce Brian, our um, very generous um, host at uh, Wharton. So please. Yes. Yeah, so uh, hi, my name's. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't. I'm <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah. So my name's uh, Ryan Sullivan. This is Jane Eisenstein. Jane Eisenstein is actually your uh, gracious Wharton host. Uh, she works with um, Data Philly and GeoPhilly to uh, put this together and trust us. So. Um, I've been going to Data Philly and Geo Philly a long time, and last summer when Mike was looking for some place to host Data Philly, it just seemed natural that there could be some place on PIN. And I work with the great people, um, Ryan's one of them, at the uh, Wharton Research Data Services, who are experts at uh, hosting events and buying really great pizza. And that's how this evening came about. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Orton. Um, and we just put a link to uh, our job listings on the bottom of the screen here. That'll stay uh, up on the other screen as well. And then I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that afterwards, we are planning on heading over to CityTap for some uh, drinks around 8 o'clock, uh, just after this ends. So uh, we'll say that again at the end. But, uh, enjoy. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, John Brannigan from Azavia up. Um, he's going to showcase the new Open Data Philly. It just launched um, two nights ago, so we're really excited to talk about it. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm John Brannigan from Azavia. Um, and yeah, we uh, launched a redesign of Open Data Philly. It was announced yesterday and uh, super excited about it. It's a uh, work that uh, Azavia did. It was found, uh, funded in part by a Knight Foundation grant. Um, and we're working with uh, the city of Philadelphia to um, point to, to their data and uh, um, also the Temple School of Media and Communication, um, who is helping us administer. Not this one? No, no that is the Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so let's do that. Oh, sure. Um, hey, here's a does. Cool. Yeah. Thank you.
And so, you know, the first thing you see is the, the design is, is very different, but we, we ported it from the platform that it was on to a platform called CCAMP, which is an open source platform. It's the Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network, CCAMP. And it powers uh, a lot of open data portals around the country and internationally, actually. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, and one of the, the unique things about Open Data Philly is that it's the, the only open data portal that is managed by the community rather than the local government. So that's, a, I think, a, a really positive thing for the open data community in Philadelphia. Um, so, uh, yeah, so check it out. You can search and download data without logging in. If you log in, you can follow organizations, follow data sets. Uh, and if you have data that you'd like to contribute, just email us at Open Data Philly. That's it. Thanks. <coughs> So our first uh, speaker tonight is going to be uh, Matt, and Matt is, is going to be giving a talk about uh, web scraping and data munching in R. Sorry, I just got to figure out how to share my screen and everything. All right, cool beans. Um, all right, so thanks, Mike, for the uh, the introduction. Um, I'm also really happy to hear somebody else call it munging. I wasn't sure exactly how it's pronounced until um, just now. So, an excellent way to start the talk. Sorry, it's so that people on the live feed stream can hear you. Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I'll just set that there. Okay, so um, basically this talk is just a high-level overview of how to do some web scraping in R and then clean up that data once you get it. Um, I apologize for not using the brand new awesome open data Philly portal. Um, it looks like a really cool resource, but uh, for now we're just going to focus on uh, my chosen project which was basically scraping uh, Craigslist departments. Um, so just to start a little bit about me, my name is Matthew McAneer. Um, that is actually my professional photo on my company's website, which is why I included it. Um, I'm a data scientist with Sierra Interactive. I graduated from Bucknell in 2013, UPenn in 14. I did a master's in nonprofit leadership here, and then uh, uh, undergrad in math and econ while I was over at Bucknell. Um, so basically, I became a data scientist even though I got that master's in nonprofit leadership, but I still like to do some volunteering work. I currently work with the Innocence Project of Pennsylvania, and I do some data analysis on their um, donor database. Um, so the other thing, I currently live in South Philly. Um, I only say that because, actually, surprise, I'm actually moving to Reno tomorrow. Uh, so that's been a little bit of what's been occupying my time this week and uh, a fun thing for me. So I'm actually taking a new job out there. Um, but should be fun. That's just a little bit about me. Um, there's no real reason you needed to know that, but I thought it was an interesting aside, so <laughs> we're going to start the talk. Um, so basically, just to start off, um, the main packages we're using are Arvist, Plier, and Dplyr. Some people call it Clear and Dplyr. Um, I don't have a preference. I prefer Plier because it's like a pair of pliers, and that's how you work with the data. Um, and then also the Magoto package. This handsome man at the bottom, that's Hadley Wickham. He wrote the top three packages, and he writes, um, he also wrote the ggplot2 package, if you're familiar with R. Um, and just as a quick aside, how many people are familiar with R in the room? All right, so that's everybody. Um, <laughs> wonderful. I hope my talk is extra good then. Uh, so basically, his packages, I, I think, um, really work well together. And so I've noticed that they're a pretty big part of my data workflow um, just from day to day. And so, kind of start out, um, I wanted to do a little bit of an overview about web scraping, because for anyone who's familiar with Python, I'm sure you've heard of the beautiful soup library, um, which I've written a few scrapers in. Um, and it's really nice, because it's just so easy and user-friendly. And the Arvis package actually works to give that similar um, sort of ease of use. And so here, what we're doing first is we're just creating some basic URLs. Um, and so for this, I decided, Let's get a more systematic way of searching for an apartment in the new city that I have to go to in a week. And so um, what I'm basically doing here is just constructing URLs um, based on a simple string manipulation algorithm. And then, then you get these URLs. 
And then with the scrape I wrote, I've got this simple wrapper, um, and the code is available on GitHub. Um, but basically what it does is you give it a list of fields that are based on a CSS selector. Um, and then you also give it the row selector. So essentially what it does is it goes in, grabs the row, and then grabs all the data within that row that you could want to look at. Um, and at the end, you just save it in a, in a normal way using kind of an L apply function. Um, so just to give a little bit more detail, um, this is actually the, the full code that I use for, um, for the scraper. And so it's pretty simple. Um, and I was really surprised when I started using the Arvis package about how easy it was. Um, and essentially, if you'll notice these pipe <coughs> operators, the percent sign greater than and then percent sign, that's part of the Magritter package. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with R's new pipe operators, but I'm pretty cool. I'm sure you do too. Um, so the problem that we have with this data when we scrape it, um, and really with a lot of data that's scraped, is it's really messy at the end. Um, so with R, it input it all as factors, which is not my favorite way to deal with string data for sure. Um, and then there's all these issues like with square footage um, versus the number of bedrooms. Those are kind of concatenated together. Um, there are dollar signs and all the prices. And so I wanted a nice effective way to take all these different columns and this data and turn it into something clean and neat. And that's really where the plier package comes in and the dplyer package and also the migrator package. Uh, so basically, the main purpose of the plier packages and the dplyer package is for easy data cleaning. Um, again, written by Hadley Wickham, but the focus is on the easy syntax and the readability. So there's also some performance gains you can get, um, but my favorite part about the packages is, is definitely the ease of the syntax and just being able to go back, read your code, and know exactly what you were trying to do. Um, there's a really easy naming convention for the plier functions. I mostly work with lists and data frames, so that's what we're going to kind of focus on in this talk. Um, but essentially, when you have this function, it's called the ply function, and you append it, at the, or not append it, sorry, you prepend it at the beginning with two letters, and it's based on the input and the output you want. Um, so as an example, we'll move on. Um, just loading some data that I scraped yesterday. Um, this is the Reno apartment data. I was thinking about scraping it live, but I didn't want to trust the internet connection, so I went ahead and did it yesterday. Um, here's that example that I was talking about with that uh, the prepended um, letters. So ddplyer is the main function that I'm using in this example, and it stands for basically you get a data frame in, and then you want to get a data frame out. And so using this, we start with uh, Reno, which is just my big list of apartments that I got. Um, you group by all the variables, and then you want to do something called mutate. And what that does is it creates a new column for you based on the old columns as a function. So you see with price, all I did was convert it to an integer after substituting the dollar signs. Um, then with this small category, I'm not exactly sure why it's called small. It's just the neighborhood or the address of the apartment. Um, but that one, you substitute some parentheses that were included. Um, and so you just go through this cleaning process and turn your factors into characters, um, and it's a really easy output. And one thing I like about the clear function is that normally when I write this, I would write several lines, and I'd have to do some kind of um, selection where it's like get all the, um, you know, select all rows which include this value. Um, and it can get a little, little wordy, a little bit verbose. And so with clear, you can have one function, and then while it doesn't look as nice on my slide, um, when you're actually looking at the code, it's really easy to format and it's really easy to follow. Um, so just as the example output where we get this data frame in and then we get it out, um, this is an example of the cleaner data. Um, and I, I reduced the number of columns that were output just for width, but essentially we have our clean prices and our um, clean string um, in the small column. So that's kind of the basic example. You can also do other things with it um, if you wanted to return a list object instead, and this is um, fairly similar to like a dictionary in Python, um, but essentially what happens is you have this key, and the keys I chose were time. So here you pass in um, some data that you want to use, um, you aggregate it by this time variable, then summarize it, and the summary that I chose was just to do the mean. And so as you see, it outputs this really clean list, this, just, this is the mean rent for this date, and then the mean rent for the next date. Um, so that's all pretty simple. Um, for me, what I use it for in my workflow the most is lots of simple data cleaning. Um, I find it to be most useful when I just need to do a few things 
um, for one variable and I need to do it for do similar things for lots of variables so that as character function um, is really easy. Um, for complex data cleaning tasks, um, I've found that using clear for that is really difficult. So for the purposes of this talk, I actually spent a long time trying to figure out a way in clear to use um, to clean up this data specifically. And the issue that I have is that when you pass in um, this vector and do something like string splitting, you end up with a new data structure somewhere in the middle of your function, which can be a little bit difficult to deal with um, kind of in line. So I found it easier to kind of work outside of this kind of one liner function, um, just because it feels a little like you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. If you work hard enough, you could probably make it happen. But at some point, I think the effort is better spent on kind of other cleaning methods. Um, Dplear is a little bit of a step in a different direction because while Clear has a lot of functions um, for different data types, Dplyr is really focused on data frames. And um, for, for that reason, I think it's become one of the biggest parts of my workflow because data frames are the thing that I use the most. Um, it's really all about data selection and data query um, for my purposes. It has, a lot of some, it has a lot of other functions like transforming and mutations as well. Um, it comes with a really simple syntax, and I found it's most powerful when you combine it with uh, pipe operators like from the Magrita package. Um, the emphasis is again on readability and the ease of use, and also there are some C++ optimizations in the dplyr code that makes it a little bit faster for production code if that's what you're aiming for. Um, so just as an example of kind of how easy the, the data munging process is with dplyr, um, this is an example problem that you might have. So I have my big list of apartments uh, that are based out of Reno, and I want to get all the ones that are less than $1,000. And instead of doing a more complicated and more verbose uh, standard R format, where you say select all these um, indexes which have a price less than this, and there's just a few more commands, you pass the simple fil sub filter command, and you just use the normal um, name of the column. And it's really simple, it's really straightforward, and then you see the summary output there. And again, there's no apartments with uh, rank greater than $1,000. Um, kind of what you would expect. So one of the reasons I like to use the chaining operations, and this is um, from the Magrita package, this pipe operator that I've been talking about, you can essentially pass the output of one function as the input of a new function. And so I found with dplyr this is especially um, powerful. And so what you can do is break down your code into really readable chunks and just have these different um, cleaning processes happen all in a row. Um, so the next example I have is just a more complicated one that I thought up where, let's say you want to get all the apartments within a certain price range. And so here it's $800 to $1,200, but I want to arrange them in decreasing order by some function that I haven't defined yet. So that was square footage per bedroom. Um, so here you filter again by price and you include just some simple Boolean logic. Um, and then you pass that over to the mutate function, that line, um, it's the third line down, and that creates your new um, bedroom per square, square foot per bedroom uh, variable. Then you just arrange it. Again, more simple syntax, extremely readable. Arrange descending by bedroom square footage. And then finally at the end, you can just say select all bedrooms, uh, sorry, select just those two columns, the bedroom by square foot column and then the price column. And at the end, you get this really clean output again. Um, so this is just a sample of the first five rows. But um, it's got much cleaner syntax overall, and it really does make the data cleaning process a lot easier for us. Um, so then, once you've got your data frame, you can use it just like any other data frame. This is a simple plot I did of the relationship between bedroom square footage and price. As you can see, there's not really much of one. Um, so no conclusions there for you. Sorry to disappoint. Um, but I just wanted to you know, give a little talk about how much um, you know, Clear is done for my workflow and essentially the ability to really have readable code. I think it's been really helpful, um, especially in my, my, uh, at my work location, nobody else uses R. So it's really nice to be able to hand somebody a piece of code and have them be able to read it almost like English and understand what it's doing. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope it makes you a little bit more interested in using Clear and Clear. Um, so if you have any questions for me, just definitely shoot them my way. So you mentioned a uh, great presentation. Thanks a lot. I got a lot of insight on R. I'm not familiar with it. You okay. mentioned using Beautiful Soup and similar to things before, maybe Scrapey. Yeah. So having done this in R and having used Beautiful Soup before, when you have to do this again, what will you use next time? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, yeah. So the question was, I have um, was basically given your experience with beautiful soup 4 and other Python packages, and then the R code um, version of the scraping, which one would you choose to use? Um, personally, I am more familiar with Python web scraping. That's really what I learned to do web scraping on. Um, so the R package, this is the first one I've written in it, and it was really easy, and this is a very basic example for me. Um, I think in deciding which one to use, I would base it more on balancing the need between maybe production level code and then also the difference between um, what you're already doing a lot of data manipulation in. So if the rest of the stuff you want to do with your data is in Python, then I'd probably write it in Python. Um, if you want to spread it across multiple machines, I'd probably use Python there too. Um, but if you're doing a very small project or a pretty, I don't know, minor project in R, um, I'm sure you could scale it up. I haven't, I don't have enough experience with the artist package to know like whether you should use it for production code. So if anybody does that and it breaks, or don't blame me. Um, but I would say that I would, I would use R when I'm already using like the dplyr functions and when I'm using it as part of my kind of basic workflow. If you've already got a lot of scripts in R, just use an R scraper. It's probably easy for you in the long run. I rambled a bit on that. I'm Thanks. sorry. Appreciate it. Good answer. Thank you. Any others? Yeah. The guy who wrote the other packages has a package called Tidy Data. Do you ever use that? Or do you find it? I haven't been using Tidy, tidy Data. I use um, the Melt package, and uh, so that or is it Melt or Recast? What's it? Yeah. Reshape. 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 That's it. Um, so I use Reshape occasionally um, as well. And so I think Tidy Data is something similar. I noticed it when I was getting ready for the talk, um, but I don't really have any experience with Tidy Data. Um, so it's a good one to look into. Thanks for the suggestion. I'll probably do that later. Anything else? All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. So uh, again, uh, unfortunately, uh, Randy, Randy switched. Uh, the virtual speaker wasn't able to come because of uh, unfortunate personal reasons, uh, personal matters. Uh, so, um, but uh, what I want to do is. Uh, and, uh, hopefully you'll come back and try to check out Julia for yourself. Uh, so basically, uh, what is Julia? So I know most people already use probably Python or R for. Oh, yeah, control. Yeah. Oh, it's just regular control. Yeah. Uh, oh. Okay. So uh, again, you're, you're probably already familiar with Python and or R, and uh, so you're probably wondering. I know the language. Um, I thought this is a, <laughs> a probably a, a good place to uh, discuss. I, 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 since we're in a university, you probably, um, if you study, you know, um, computational science uh, or uh, or any type of uh, analytics uh, or statistics, maybe you went into uh, MATLAB, for example. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is, uh, not only you have to are you forced to pay for MATLAB. Uh, once you, you you're done with your assignment you know, in machine learning or uh, uh, or uh, applied linear algebra, then that lab code is pretty much useless after you're done. Uh, so uh, again, um, that's not the uh, the main reason why you cho choose Julia. Uh, again, it's it advertises itself as um, doing very elegant pseudo uh, pseudo code like uh, syntax, uh, but the speed of C. Uh, again, that's a and uh, if you if you go into the benchmarks here, uh, we get, again, uh, Julia is only in that version 0. Point, well, right now it's 0. 0.3.6, and right now, it's, uh, as you can see here, uh, it has, if it has a score of one, it's uh, about the same speed of C. And uh, as you can see here, uh, it's very close to Fortran. And this is uh, Python with uh, using NumPy arrays, for example. And uh, R and uh, and, uh, and Octave all the way over here. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, again, uh, it's a it's I guess a uh, I guess a computational science stream of, without having to optimize uh, your code uh, uh, and get optimized like speed uh, optimized speed almost. Uh, so. Uh, I, um, we we have some I guess conference uh, from I guess the sci uh, again uh, we're not on track of Peter or anything but again I'm not really part of Julia but uh, again I found this language uh, 
very interesting. But, uh, again, it's a nice tool to keep, another tool to keep uh, in your arsenal when you're uh, doing a, you know, uh, machine learning data analysis and stuff like that. And uh, here, uh, David Sand Professor David Sanders to give some advantages of Julia. On YouTube, uh, there, uh, he has a talk on, uh, I guess, instruction Julia for people who have a Python or MATLAB background. Uh, some, as I said here, it's uh, about two or three times the speed of C. Uh, again, very easy to learn. And uh, one of the main things uh, is this uh, uh, infamous two language problem. For those who don't know, the, the language problem is uh, there's lots of trade off between very uh, uh, e easy to understand languages like Python and Ruby and, uh, and very fast languages like uh, uh, C or C. You always have to make a trade off between the two. And the, uh, the team and Julia are attempting to, yeah, I guess, solve that problem by uh, having Julia, I guess. Okay, uh, so uh, so uh, I guess right now is a good time as any to introduce you to, uh, I guess right now, uh, sorry. I'm not, uh, it might be, uh, right now it's somewhat of a hassle to download it if you're not familiar with, uh, I guess, command line or, or Linux or Unix commands. Mm -hmm. uh, right, if you go to juliabox.com, or .org, sorry, uh, you, if you have a Google account, uh, they have a, for those of you who uh, know of IPython, uh, they have a, a, a version of IPython, or have a, 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 a IPython kernel called iJulia. And uh, just and you can sign here, and, and and I already did that. And people who are familiar with IPython are probably familiar with this layout. Uh, it's a bunch of notebooks have a nice, like have a nice interface. Uh, and I'll do some examples. Oh, and uh, uh, just just to let you know, uh, for, for Julia again said uh, version zero point three point six, uh, even though it's very fast. Uh, uh, but it doesn't have all the things you probably want from R or uh, Python, so I'd, uh, just keep that in mind when you're trying it out. But, uh, but uh, here are some good ways to get familiar with Julia. In a way, if you program in MATLAB uh, or NumPy, it, you pretty much already, in a way, you pretty much already know how to program in Julia. Uh, very easy. Uh, here's your typical uh, variable assignments. And uh, thank you. And, uh, Command plus. Command plus. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, is that better? Okay. Maybe a little bit better. Can you see uh, in the back? Perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, and they can also do a uh, pretty much any Unicode character you want. So if, so those of you, that's no, pretty slow. Uh, I mean, the, I mean, uh, not Julia, but uh, now <laughs> I, I, uh, since I zoomed in, uh, it's, <laughs> um, I'm supposed to, uh, supposed to be backslash there. <laughs> I, mean, I can't even see it here. Uh, well, anyways, um, it, you can uh, uh, finally um, you can have uh, Oriental uh, Greek letters like alpha. Uh, those of you like functional programming, and, uh, yeah, but just push tab at the end. Uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, you can treat them like you know any other uh, variable. See, and uh, yeah, this this is another thing I like. Uh, if you're defining functions, you don't have to write um, two uh, two star x. To, uh, to its second power, you can just, uh, this is pretty much 2, 2x, 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. And that compiles. Get what you expect. And uh, uh, here's some uh, similar uh, connect with strings. Yeah, yeah well, more uh, Greek letters. Uh, so, It also has uh, many, many type of uh, uh, integer types and flow and uh, flow types, uh, arbitrary position arithmetic. 
Okay, uh, let me skip down here. Oh, complex numbers if you're a real math nerd. Uh, 3.5 IM is uh, 3.5 I here. Right? Okay. And uh, <laughs> rational numbers too, apparently. Uh, okay, uh, oh, this is probably what you're, you're waiting for, actual uh, vectors or arrays. So it's very similar to uh, like an IPython, I mean a Python list. And uh, oh yes. Do you have to care about numerical types like you do? In no, 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 like in this like example here, like integer versus you know float, floating point numbers. Do you need to care about that, or does Julia sort of abstract that away? Uh, I think in this last example, uh, it abstracts away. Uh, Obviously, because there's a and, and that seems to be using just yeah yeah brackets. I mean I mean uh, good, yeah. it looks like you don't need to care. No, well in certain cases no. I mean but for uh, well, let's try an example. Uh, no, well yeah, just uh, type inference. Uh, so uh, if you do like a like an array of three and a uh, or the string a, uh, it'll still work. Yeah, and uh, syntax is very similar. It starts at one, not at zero. That's uh, another important thing. Uh, if you remember, yeah, the first thing is uh, three point zero. Does index zero in a list throw an exception, or does it do the equivalent of negative one? Down zero. Oh, it, it just doesn't okay, work. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, and instead of uh, uh, unlike uh, Python, it, 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 you can't do negative one for the ant, for the last uh, index. For example, here, uh, yeah, get another bounce error. Okay, uh, where's my? Oh, should I go further since the other talk is in? Okay, uh, I, I will, uh, Randy uh, gave a talk uh, a couple months ago. Uh, this isn't the same talk he was going to give, but uh, it, it's a bit more interesting since it involves a little machine learning. Uh, so yeah, he was here before. Okay, so I'll. So uh, for those of you who know by Python again, uh, it, it provides a nice interface. Um, if you want to say, um, oh, what? <laughs> uh, sorry, I'll look at it later. Uh, uh, whoever uh, was talking about IPython. Um, so, uh, for example, if you want to uh, give a, le a lecture on linear regression, uh, you can uh, do do simple logic like uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if you want to get started with Julia, uh, a good way, uh, for those of you who use R, there's uh, there's a package that just contains but just only data sets. And um, yeah, we, we have the same thing too. And uh, also, uh, we also have a, a version of ggplot2. Oh, oops, I forgot. Uh, control, okay, plus. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, uh, so uh, also thanks for uh, uh, I think even of those of you who have heard of Apache Spark, even there, even they are uh, having their own version of uh, data frames. But, um, Julia has them too. Uh, of course, not as mature as R, but uh, it has the same uh, the same idea behind it. For example, uh, if you want the so for the MT cars data set, and uh, you want to look at the column uh, DS, DISP and MPG. Uh, it, it, and so those call, uh, uh, description of this column, uh, a summary, uh, a statistical summary of those columns. And uh, here's, uh, for those of you who love ggplot, here's uh, your first example. Yeah, yeah G on point, uh, for those of you who know, know of that uh, beautiful uh, ggplot syntax. Uh, okay, and uh, And if you want, uh, if you want to do matrix multiplication, for example, you would have to turn the data frame back into a 
uh, in a regular way. And uh, uh, this is the, for those of you who've taken the, you know, uh, uh, stats class or machine learning class, this is pretty much uh, 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 known as linear regression. Uh, here, here's your beta inverse. Oh, sorry. Again, beautiful uh, uh, Greek letters. And, uh, yeah. and once you have uh, your, uh, your beta, you, you, can, yeah, you can plot out your line here uh, very easily in the in here, it's uh, if for those of you who know of uh, GPOT, uh, this is uh, using layers. Uh... Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he also gave an example on take, uh, take gradient descent. Uh, uh, now, for those of you who uh, take a machine learning class, uh, once, uh, you're, once you have more and more variables, uh, inverted matrices can be computationally expensive. Uh, so uh, here's the next best thing, uh, we're going to send that your stochastic. And, uh, and now here, for those of you who are familiar with uh, MATLAB uh, ma uh, matrix, uh, when you see this dot here, uh, this means element-wise, uh, element-wise, uh, um, in this case, uh, subtraction. Okay. And uh, here's your cost function here. Uh, if you've taken the Coursera machine learning course, uh, yeah. And uh, like you said, that's this is pretty much the answer. If you had to pro program in machine learning class, you have to program it in MATLAB. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, here's your output. And uh, once again, it gives you it do that again. GG plot does the same thing. Uh, okay, so uh, again, uh, since uh, that's pretty much it's been 10 minutes, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, again, uh, Julia is a very young language. Again, uh, it's not at version 1.0 yet. Uh, it'll take a while, uh, but um, again, it, it's a very uh, nice language to try if you felt like you know you want a very nice, clean uh, syntax that, that's great for you know matrix. Uh, computation, uh, I highly recommend it. And uh, for those of, let's see. So I have a quick question. Oh, yes? Um, so it, it seems like you have, you get all of the kind of uh, optimized matrix operations um, that you also get from things like uh, NumPy and SciPy. Mm -hmm. um, but what other kind of programming patterns does it, you know, make? support or make easier, faster, uh, by making use of the, like, of the JIT? Um, can you just program with like loops like you would oh, yeah, they, in a language, and you, can you get the benefit of just in time to play? Well, for example, uh, using for loops, for example, uh, yeah, I think they actually encourage that. Uh, yeah. That makes it faster. Oh, uh, oh, sure. Uh, so uh, he, he was asking, well, what are some other differences between NumPy and uh, uh, I guess Julia, and uh, wondering if, uh, for, example, for example, for loops uh, can uh, make computations faster. Yet, yeah. and the answer is uh, most cases yes. Uh, in fact, those of you who've heard uh, Kaggle.com, uh, there's actually a tutorial that, that actually encourage uh, encourages you know the use of uh, for loops when doing uh, uh, cer certain operations. So, yeah, that's another resource you can look at as well. Uh, okay, um, and also there's some other things in, uh, that uh, set Julia really apart from, uh, say, NumPy or R. Uh, multiple dispatches. So uh, for those of you who know Java, uh, for example, you have the same uh, method or, or function. That, uh, with, I mean, uh, I mean, a uh, method function with the same name with, uh, as another function or method. Uh, you, you want uh, if you define it with different types, you, you, can, you produce a different result, uh, depending on how you define it. Define it. Uh, so uh, it's it's very elegant to the point that uh, if you just I don't know, my talk is sort of over <laughs> at this point. Um, if you go on uh, GitHub uh, and uh, look at um, any of the the for example, say, should be a stats. Oh, yeah. 
uh, Julie Stats uh, is one of the more uh, well-maintained uh, 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 organizations and uh, GitHub organizations uh, uh, within the Julie ecosystem. You, know, you have a package time series, MCMC inference. Uh, I wonder if there's a one for distribution out here. I'm going to skip it to multiple dispatch in a second. Uh, uh, yeah, something easy. Uh, so this is well. Oh, uh, so what I'm showing you here is that mean uh, is defined with a type. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'll make it bigger. Okay. Uh, uh, so that keep reminding me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so um, mean is already defined in, a, in, a, in another uh, in another file, but. With multiple dispatch, you can depend, you can define it with using a different type, and you don't have to use you know define, use type in function mean something something. Uh, that's another nice thing about Julia is that uh, it, it provides a very easy way to define functions with the same name but with different types. That's pretty much yeah. Plus, have also cool macros and other stuff like that for like you know, <coughs> hardcore programmers to make things faster or easier. Uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm pretty much past the time limit, but uh, again, I'll take any questions. Uh, yes. Yeah, I uh, my limited experience with R, mm -hmm. it's sort of if it can fit on your computer, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Does Julia is it intended to scale up much more than R? Uh, I, I think the, the the amount of it just does the same thing in uh, or the same things that R does or Python does, but faster, pretty much, without having to, you know, fiddle with C or C plus plus code. Uh, that, that's the main uh, uh, objective of Julia. This is Julia. Um, hmm? I know in, in R there's like an R Py package, and I think in oh, Python there's yeah. something similar where you can read code from either language in either language. I was wondering if Julia um, had the capability to read. Like our code or Python code, and if it did, it ran it faster. I'm not sure about the speed, but I know, I know they're definitely uh, there's definitely an R2 an R2 Julia package, I think. Uh, again, all this stuff is on on GitHub. Uh, yeah, you can also check out the. Hopefully you'll be here. Oh, there's I Julia. Data structures. Yeah, again, um, so even though it's not mature, things like data structures, distributions, uh, also uh, um, optimization, those packages are very well maintained. So uh, yeah, please check those out. Um, this I, well, I, I, know, I, know, I know that they, I can't find it at that moment, but I know they have uh, packages that uh, do what you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, yes? It really sounds very good for, for math, but mm -hmm. like Python, Python can handle like string manipulation, you know, if you want to list some files for certain mm -hmm. things, can Julia handle that stuff? Or? Uh, I haven't tried that myself, but there have, there are, uh, there is a, again, uh, I'm not the Julia expert, uh, Randy, Randy is, but uh, uh, the, 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 they have a, uh, some packages, I guess, they're not well, as well maintained on natural language processing. Uh, if if you go, there's also again a YouTube uh, uh, channel for it, and uh, yeah, there's a a video on natural language processing in Julia. Uh, I, I would that would probably be a better uh, source of information than okay, I can so give you. you. It's a general language. It's not just just for math. Just now, yeah, I, I think the focus right uh, focus right now is mostly for math and um, statistics. But I, I, again, um, this is it's an open source language, so you know you can. You know, do, I, I'm sure there are people working on uh, you know, natural language processing, Julia. Yeah. Uh, did that answer your question, sort of? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's the, I, I'm not very familiar with uh, yeah string manipulation in, in, in Julia. Sorry. 
right, thanks. Okay, introduce Lauren Ancona, who is the new data scientist for the city's Office of Open Data. And um, I also wanted to mention that this Saturday is International Open Data Day. So this event ties well into the spirit of open, open data and um, civic participation in um, the data that cities uh, release. So Lauren will tell us about um, how to build awesome things from, from open data, among other things. Hi. Is everybody as cold as I was getting? <laughs> Are my ears so bright red? They were like on fire when I walked in the door. Anyway, um, so I started uh, with the city back in December, but my background is a little bit different. Um, I actually went to, went to college for music um, and then spent about 10 years in the nonprofit arts marketing area, but I got really into um, marketing analytics um, and data-driven um, campaign creation, and I had to measure everything, and then it kind of just like went down hill from there. Um, I, I sort of happened into um, open data via civic hacking. Um, I ended up at a hackathon last May, I think, and um, there was a. Hmm. That works. Um, for EdTech, uh, for um, it was a part of, uh, sponsored by Code for Philly, uh, which is a local civic hacking group, and um, ended up working on a project that was just visualizing the budget, and it sort of opened my eyes to all the resources that are available to us through the city, about the city. Not all of it is directly sourced from uh, the government. Uh, there are civically created sets, too. Um, there's a project right now called Tree Finder, where People in the neighborhood map all the trees, and it aggregates all of that data. I don't have a screenshot of that, but if you Google Tree Finder in Philly, um, it's an effort to map every single tree in the city and what it is, what kind, what species. I mean, and you just can kind of extrapolate from there. There's um, Cycle Philly, is actually one of the highest profile code for Philly projects that's out there right now. Um, but anyway, I kept going back um, through the summer and started learning um, all kinds of new things. I had always sort of hovered around the periphery of web development, but never delved in. And it led to, um, actually, and I don't know, forgive me if you've heard the story before or if it's another geophily meetup, because I have told this, but has anybody? Oh, that's pretty awesome for me, actually. Um, I've been obsessed with parking data for years in the city and, and finding, you know, why they're not at the central repository where I can look up where it's okay to park, when it's okay to park. You know, am I going to get a ticket this time at this day? Yes. Why can't I look ahead by address, you know? <laughs> or why can't I, the phone does this thing now, you know? Why can't I just say, I'm here, is it legal? Um, so I started digging into that, and it turns out there wasn't even a map of the residential parking permit area. So I made one, and I never made a map. Uh, I sort of Googled around, didn't know anything about geographic information formats. Um, didn't even know what a polygon was in this context. But I found Mapbox, which is sort of one of the newer players in this space. Um, it gives you the ability, Mapbox, Mapbox specifically, unlike the way I ended up using it, is really to host customized tiles, custom tiles. It accesses OpenStreetMap data layers and allows you to style them um, on top of that, which is actually pretty interesting if you're interested at all in GIS and you want to create customized base maps. And it uses something called Carto CSS, which is just like the CSS we use on the web, except it's got this extension of selectors for things like, at this zoom level, do this. Make the lines thicker at this zoom level, make the lines thinner, things like that. Apply this texture, remove these features. If you've ever watched a, a web map reload, you'll see it happens in tiles, and those are the things that Mapbox styles for you. That's generally intended to sort of sit underneath the data that you're rendering. Um, and so this is, how many people are part of Geophilly, actually? It seems like there's, oh, okay, that's a healthy. And data. How many of you are both? 
Okay. <laughs> it just seems like everybody was hands. Um, so we're going to this. This is this map is actually live at this URL. Um, you can look it up now. If you tap anywhere inside of the zone, it will tell you actually. This is an old screenshot. I have subsequently overlaid the the, no, the zone number on top now, so you don't have to do anything. It's just it's a silly map, but the PPA noticed it. And they tweeted at me and asked why I did it. <laughs> uh, actually, they asked, they asked if I'd like to come in, and that was scary. But um, so I went and met with them. I was just a civilian. I actually, and I frankly, never intended to work for the government. I didn't have a background that was a natural uh, lead into this. So I went and met with them, and they, they asked why I didn't. And I said, well, it didn't exist. So I wanted it, and I made it. Which is sort of where civic hacking comes from. You see something in your neighborhood, in your area, that you think you can improve with the skills you have, and you just kind of hop in. Um, if anybody's interested in talking about that, uh, I have since sort of become involved as a core team member for Code for Philly, and we meet every week. It alternates between Tuesdays and Thursdays in the evenings. Um, and there is a fair amount of need for uh, both data and GIS resources there. Um, my project is. Arkadelphia, which sort of grew out of this first layer that one would need to apply to, to aggregate all the possible rules and restrictions in the city to, to get a big picture of what makes it legal or illegal to park. Um, the BPA actually did release one data set, and it, it includes, this is all the meter, the meter inventory in the city. Um, it's sort of a, a mess. Um, ended up throwing it in R and doing some transformation that's Another one of those skills I've been working on. Um, and these lines with no data, each one of these is one meter. So every time you see a hole, it's just that there's a second set of rules for that meter. So all of the meter IDs had to be written down. And there are whole there swaps with you know six sets of rules. So a lot of it was a very rough primer on hygiene and cleansing and organizing, normalizing your data. Um, and it's not geocoded. So none of the tickets in the city have location information. In fact, the, the tickets when they're written are, it's an open entry field. There's no pick list for streets. or I think there might be a pick list for streets. So it's a mess. It, there's, you know, and, and this is the system that the PPA is actually working with. So when we talk about open data and why aren't we releasing more sets more quickly, the legacy systems that are in place right now would boggle your mind. Um, Sometimes it's sort of interesting that anything is getting done. Uh, since I've started at the city, um, we've uh, begun the process of trying to get our heads around what you know, what's there, what, how old is it. The process of upgrading these things on on a rolling basis is an insane undertaking because you can't have any downtime, you know. Um, but I digress. Um, slowly trying to accumulate all the layers necessary to build an app like this. And again, back in May, I had no mapping skills at all. So it's been database architecture, <laughs> everything from how to geocode, how to represent um, points. There's a whole set of 50 um, free parking lots. If you have a residential permit for that neighborhood in the city, that sort of are, most people know the one in their neighborhood, but there's actually 50 of them around the city, and they don't exist anywhere like the residential map. There's no reference for those, so I actually hand drew those as shapes, and that's another layer that goes in the pile. And then there's other things, surface lots, garages, um, and that's just the public stuff, that's not private. There's, private stuff has been indexed and re-indexed. There's all these um, aggregator apps that are popping up everywhere, but, but Philadelphia doesn't have the data available. Um, we're, not, we're not really sure even if what there is has geographic data associated. It may, it may, I may well build this by hand and that would be the first version of it. So um, I digress. Basically, getting involved at this level was what led to me working for the city. Um, I ended up meeting the PPA, and the open data folks had been wanting to um, get in the door there, but they are a state agency. So they're not necessarily subject to um, Mayor Nutter's 2012 executive order that Philadelphia will be a participant in the open data community. Um, so I was able to connect those the people that I met with, with the city office, and eventually um, there was a position that was coming open, and it, I kind of was confused at first why I wanted to do that, but it's fascinating. I mean, all the things that we get to talk about now. One of the major undertakings that we've done in the last um, few 
few weeks since a few weeks, I guess a couple months now since I started is, um, well, we didn't know how many sets or where they were, who's, who's collecting what kind of data. So the city has used over 150 sets to this point. Um, and they have up to this point been hosted, some of them are static files on GitHub, some of them are APIs, um, some of them are, all of them hopefully were listed on a centralized repository called Open Data Philly. Does everybody know about Open Data Philly? Have you seen it before? Um, I include a bunch of links in this presentation that I'll, uh, I'll tweet a, um, a link to in the end because most of the things that I speak about are included. Um, but basically, in certain contexts, it's not necessarily in the best interest of the government to build all of the software around these, these kinds of things that we can build on top of the data that we collect. So they've collected as a part of business process. But making it available to the public it serves several functions. Some of it is like a checks and balances thing, some of it's transparency, um, and allowing a dialogue between lawmakers, government staff. Um, and we needed a way to organize all of what there was. And so before I started in the summer, the Open Data Services, the data services team undertook a census. And that exact that is now online at open um, slash data, um, which is the next slide I'll show you. This is actually just a timeline um, of all of the sets that have been released up until now. Um, so there's a sense of that everything that's available, everything that we have, where it lives, and if you go visit um, uh, that site, you can see what's a, what, what is extant. The next step was then understanding what isn't published. So starting in November, I think, we are meeting with every department in the city, over 56 departments. Once we go in and meet with a department, we then get a list from a key stakeholder there that is all of the folks in the subunits that we need to speak to. So for example, in the case of the fire department, I think we're on meeting 11 of 15, and that's just in the fire department. But I, we think it's important, important to know what's there, because then how do we, you know, this actually is happening at, on a federal level right now as well. Uh, just Friday, uh, the Sunlight Foundation won a lawsuit that had been going on for two years for the federal government to aggregate all of their, their um, open data, uh, what are they calling them, enterprise data sets. So each department has been required to keep an internal uh, and an external listing of those enterprise level data sets. But now it's going to be released as one set, one big index to everything the federal government collects and then split out by department. And that, uh, you know, there's a lot of resistance there, um, but it's gonna be, I think it's gonna make a big difference. We've actually, it's a, my slides are sort of out of order for my brain, but um, this is the current index, uh, census for what is existing now with the city of Philadelphia. And uh, our, um, our recent uh, inventory has coincided nicely with the relaunch of Open Data Philly, um, which uh, Sarah works at Azavia. They partnered with um, they're partnered with Temple, and um, Temple is actually going to take back curatorship of that site. But it is an aggregator of all the data, open data in Philadelphia, and that doesn't just mean from the city of Philadelphia. Some of it comes from private sources, um, anybody, anybody, right? Anybody can register and host a data set. Um, and it can host it in almost any format, and geographic formats, API access, API metadata, um, static sets. And so for the city, from the city standpoint, eventually um, we're very close to creating our own store um, as a central, place for everything we have. So it's not going to be on GitHub anymore or only on GitHub. It's going to be more up to date. As a part of our data inventory, uh, we want to have a way to, sorry, I'm going to think I want to put this, a way to present everything that's both out there and keep it up to date. So it's like once you have the list, then the second it, you know the data gets updated, and these are from disparate systems all across the city, how do we pull in these sets and how do we um, keep it up to date, but not interfere with the daily workflow of the people that are interacting with them. And so we're talking about a centralized store with an ETL layer on top of that um, that then exposes the data to a forward facing, an outwardly facing uh, interface like this website. And that actually just relaunched yesterday. 
So we we'll take a look. One of the other functions of Open Data Theory is actually to open the um, what is available up for feedback. So if you go look at the list of sets there, there are places to comment um, beneath each individual data set. We do look at that. We're actually um, incorporating that into our workflow in terms of prioritizing what we release. So we are asking for feedback from the public. If there's something that's not there they're interested in, um, drop a line. We are aggregating that. and. It goes into a formula uh, along with uh, a few other factors, such as level of difficulty, how much refining needs to happen before we can release this, um, release that data. Question? Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, I haven't seen the data, so just my ignorance. Uh, do you have any data that exposes uh, residents' private information? No, it's a really good question, though, because um, yeah. Um, the question was, do we have or release any data that exposes residents' private information, which is a major part of the conversation about open data. Um, so on an individual level, as we go into the departments and speak with people who are the managers of, data, of certain data, um, one of the things that we have to talk about with them and you know, to the public is how are we making sure that someone can overlay a certain set of data with some geographic information and extrapolate personal civilian information from that? Because it has been done, in fact. Um, there have been some issues with, um, I think it was New York, had they released their taxi data, their trip data, and they had hashed, I think it was the driver ID number or the driver's, maybe the driver's license number. It was personally identifiable for the taxi driver. And it had been hashed, but it was reversible. Um, and somebody white had that and gave it back to them and said, hey guys, you probably should do this better. Um, one of the challenges in that though is it's not something that you can just lop off of the set, right? Because you can't refresh, you can't release an up-to-date set um, without regenerating the entire thing, which is sort of inefficient in the long term. Um, forgive me if I'm not using nomenclature that makes sense to people that have done this for much longer than I have, but... Um, the question from the internet from your live stream. Uh, do you have data sets for Delaware Valley? Open data Philly, Mike? I think that there are some Delaware, what is it, Regional Planning Commission has sets that are published on Open Data Philly. Um, they wouldn't be hosted on the city's site or even listed in the city census because they're not forced from the city government, but they are available. What if, if there are ones that are available at that level, it would be probably listed on Open Data Philly or check with the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Committee, right? DVRPC? I can't remember. Maybe also mentioned PASDA. Oh, PASDA, which is the state level, yeah. So um, the state of Pennsylvania has a fair, uh, a fair assortment of data that's available, a lot of it is geographic um, or data that is relevant when. Consider, considering geographic information. Um, they have things like traffic data um, for the um, main arterials in Philadelphia, which is interesting to look at. Trip data, how, how much traffic is happening uh, over time. And they do keep that set pretty up to date. Um, trying to think. Um, that's just off the top of my head without being able to look. I know that, that the state, if you look, um, is it past that up? If you if you're switching between apps, if you could reshare on Blue Jeans, the oh, folks. Yeah, that's why I'm not. I'm like afraid to switch to change anything. Um, yeah, just P A F D A. Um, this is actually pretty cool. This they just put this out. I think I saw this on U.S. Open Data is an independent organization. Um, if you go to that website. Kind of playing on. Let me Google that for you. Um, that is an aggregate of all of the data that I believe is released by. I can't remember what level it is. I just found it the other night. Oops, go back. How do I make it do the thing? Let's go back. Can I click on it? <laughs> Sorry. I hate technical difficulties. Anyway, go to that website. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't know how to switch back. It's, I'm afraid this is such a tenuous setup here because of the live stream. Um, let's try it.
Yeah, you're still, you're still, you're still sharing, sharing your uh, slide. It's still back there, so if I press it here, it'll go. Anybody? I would say the less you can do with technology at this point, the better. <laughs> yeah. All right. Try that. The irony. Oh, that's great. I can see your um, web page is not available. <laughs> Man, that's so confusing. All right, I give up. I go back to this photo. Anybody? Technology. How does it? How does it work? <clears throat> well, this is boring. Sorry. Let's try this guy. Now, who's seeing that on the stream? Which one do I press? Uh, now that's your video. You just need to turn that off. Um, I, honestly, I think at this point it's just back in the day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not going anywhere out of that. And the, and the meeting video is seeing everything, everything that we're seeing on the on the screen. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's good. Cool. Oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, those are some repositories where you can find sources of uh, data if you want to start playing with some data sets. I thought maybe it would be interesting to go through something I did for fun recently. Um, I was trying to think of things that might meet at the intersection of geophily and data philly and think of me as the elementary schooler in the room in terms of data analysis. Um, I come at it more from a design standpoint and uh, probably have done more GIS related data than anything else. Um, however, the um, government, the Gentile Services Administration, yeah, at the federal level, released a data set of all of the .gov websites in, that are registered. So it's from the, it's at the registrar level. And I thought it'd be fun to sort of see where they are in the, in the country. And it's sort of a, uh, kind of a boring set if you look at it. It's in terrible shape. Um, so have, have, how many of you have ever tried to geocode something that was not, did not already have geographic data? <laughs> associated with it. Okay. So there are a few ways you can do it. There are a few, I mean, the Google API is cool, but it's throttled after a certain point. Um, it, if you're doing anything and exporting it from Google, it's going to spit it out as a KML, which is a terrible file format that I just, it, it's a nightmare to sort of convert. Um, and uh, then there's Smarty Streets, but the resolution isn't that great. So it's like, you know, it's only accurate to like, a mile or something like that, which is like not at all at all accurate. Um, so there, you kind of have to like slice and dice it ahead of time. You can do code by city and state. Um, I was working in uh, an application called CartoDB. Have you heard of CartoDB? Um, basically, it's a MySQL backend with a geographic front end. It's and it lets you toggle back and forth between the views, so you can look at your table. And then if you've got geo georeference data in the table, it will show up on the map. And so it's actually a really great way to sort of learn. Um, it's Postgres SQL um, with PostGIS. And then if you look on GitHub at their stack, it's insane. There's like a billion different uh, dependencies. But um, it lets you sort of play. In fact, I, started, I hadn't worked with SQL in a long time. And you can sort of write your query right in the, in the side panel there and see if it works on the map and see what it pulls up from your ta table. So it's actually a really nice beginner's tool if you just want to practice basic SQL statements and see it render on a map in real time. It's free, accounts are free. Um, they used to limit it to the number of map views for the things that you publish, but it's not, it's not limited anymore. I think they just limit the number of sets you can have up at any one time. Um, and so I, grew, I started refining, there were so many misspellings in this set because it was sourced from, um, if you've ever registered for a domain name, that's the data that they were pulling. So if somebody just was like going quickly and mistyped the name of the town that they were registering for, that's what we had to work with. So um, after about five iterations, and I think it took five passes for it to actually um, to get it down to 100, yeah, with 100 URLs that would, would not geocode, and those I just did by hand. I had to like correct spellings and fix it out. Um, this is what it looks like on a map, actually, and it's a little bit off. The teal is city level government, the red is federal, the royal blue is the county, and then the green is uh, native sovereign nations. Um, 
I just thought it would be interesting to play with. And I ended up uh, taking, I exported my uh, files of GeoJSON and a couple of other um, geographic formats and sent it back to the GSA. I just uh, forked the repo and was like, hey, you guys want this? It's way cleaner than your stuff. And they said, actually, no, we can't take it <laughs> because it's not theirs and I don't work with them, uh, which is another interesting debate, right? My, my data is absolutely in better shape than what they have. It was a mess. The URLs, these are actually all linked. You can click on them and an info window pops up. Um, I had a URL here somewhere to give you if you want to go look at this. Um, it is, oh, look at that. I'm smart. Um, you can go play with it. You click on it, and then I also uh, overlaid the URL for and click through to that website right from the map. It was just a silly little project to do, but it's a place that if you've never done anything with geographic information, it's a simple thing that you can start with. Um, my set is available on GitHub, and I have the link that I will include in this. In this uh, in the slide deck, um, hopefully that wasn't super jumbled and I didn't get super technical with how to do it. Um, Carto lets you upload in multiple formats. You could do um, CSV, XML. Um, if you've got pre-configured, um, pre-referenced geodata, I think it takes GeoJSON and shapefile. Yeah, it does database, not boxes, geo databases, but I don't think Carto does. Okay. So, um, so both Mapbox and CartoDB are free tools that you can play around with um, and and publish maps to the web um, and start start seeing you know what your data looks like when it's rendered under physical features. Um, that's sort of the end of what I wanted to get through. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. How do you like to work for the government now? You know, I'm really lucky. My the office in which I work, the Office of Innovation and Technology, um, is sort of this sweet spot of a bunch of young folks who um, decided sort of to. They all had everybody had careers in other areas. There's some really talented technicians in there. Technology. What's the word I want? Technologists. Thank you. Um, long day. And. Uh, these, these folks are just, you know, they can be making a lot more money in the private sector, but the opportunities here now, the open data movement has some steam in the city. The next mayoral election is going to play a big part in whether or not we continue to um, strive for a higher level of transparency. Or um, there are some cases where um, Honolulu, Hawaii is a good example, where they had a really robust open data program. They hosted Pro to America fellows um, for a year. And then when the administration changed, all got wiped away. They just like stopped releasing data. They didn't have any more folks working on um, that kind of civic technology. Um, one of the other major initiatives in my department is uh, redesigning the Philadelphia website. <laughs> so if you go to alpha.philo.gov, you can see a preview. And we are also soliciting feedback for that as well. Um, in line, at, on every page, there's a link. And if you think something's terrible, tell us. If you like the way the direction that redesign is going, let us know that too. Um, and it's being done iteratively, iteratively so that um, it's not going to be one big sort of like closeted ramp and then we deploy and then we're done and everybody's like, OK, thanks, and go home. Um, it, it's being done out in the open on purpose so that hopefully we can build something that's a little more functional. How can, uh, how can people in the community get, get involved? So I will, um, I'll tweet a link to this presentation. It has a bunch of these links to data sets. You can just grab something. After that first hackathon that I went to, uh, I think I spent a weekend. And like after that, I probably had a list of every set that was available on Open Data Affiliate in my head. I started taking uh, school districts. The school district of Philadelphia has actually released a fair amount of data. They have. Uh, data about the catchments, demographic student information within those catchments, and then they have a separate set for the schools. And so I just started playing around with um, joining uh, because those, you know, you can sort of infer the, what the population of certain schools look like. Um, and then if you were to go, say, get some census data and look at what the overall population looks like versus the population or the, the catchment, school catchment areas. And it's just, it's a really interesting way to start working with um, geographic data and, and also get to know Philadelphia, I think, too. Have you, uh, 
done most of these things. It looks like we've done most of like uh, that and visualizations. We've done them in data mining, any of those sources. What I have done, yeah, what I have done, um, and I don't know that, that my definition of mining may coincide with someone that's really deep uh, um, working with, you know, terabyte size sets, but um, mining actually comes from a marketing standpoint, so I'm like crawling the web or pulling in data from social media feeds or the Twitter fire hose, which is awesome if you can get access to it, but it's really expensive. Um, you can, uh, there's a couple of like light, if you want to start playing with that, say it is a data set or something that's published on, in a table on a website um, and you, you want to grab it and throw it in R and manipulate it, there's a Kimono app, kimonoapp.com. Uh, it's basically a, uh, it's a scraper, but you can uh, basically map all of the class or element IDs on a page and it'll go and, and hit, pull that in and it creates an API for you that you can then query. Um, or you can download it as a static set. Um, the other one is uh, uh, one of those dot IOs. Import dot <laughs> IO, which is it's instead of a, a web app, uh, it's a desktop app that's really a web app. It's just you download the thing, um, and it does a similar thing. I think we've got a slightly different approach in the way that you can map uh, what data you want to grab, but it uses the HTML elements to map um, the values. Um, one of the good, a good example of that is the state of PA has a database you can search for liquor license uh, approvals or like, like your liquor licenses and then if there's been a violation that's listed there too. But it's not, you can't get it anywhere in static set. So I actually used Kimono to go, I haven't played with it yet, but scrape the site. Um, I mean there's other ways you can do this stuff. I know um, somebody just built uh, it for three days, I think they used Python and something else, the script. They scraped all the Airbnb, Airbnb data for New York City for three days in January, and he just put up, it's called like Airbnb in New York, and it's, he's released the data if you want to go play with it. And he wanted to look at, you know, where, uh, you know, prices obviously, but then also um, where the, you were more likely to find, you know, whole residence versus private room versus private uh, shared room kind of thing, and he mapped all of that too. That's pretty interesting. I don't remember the URL, but if you just Google Airbnb, New York data. Um, that just came out. It's pretty cool. We have time for one more question, and I think we're going to get to that. Is there, this is a little bit out of the field, but um, is there a way to, does anyone try to uh, map um, uh, congressional redistricting uh, over the years and, and overlay that with racial makeup? And show at the, the, at the city years. level or the federal level? Well, federal, just say the congressional district or the state level. Sunlight Foundation, I think, has done a lot of that work. If you go to sunlight, sunlight.org, sunlightfoundation.org, they, if they haven't presented it in a finished format like that, the data is, is either there or um, available from uh, the federal government. And uh, then the census data would give you, or the ACS probably, uh, the American Community Survey. Um, which is sort of like a subset of rolling, uh, would give you some of the demographic changes, I think. Also, um, so Azania has a white paper on redistricting, um, and it's certainly worth checking out. It has a lot to do with um, <clears throat> gerrymandering and um, how how districts changed over time. So if you Google um, redistricting and the Azania white paper. <clears throat> in fact, isn't Philadelphia changing in 2016? There's a this, 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 yeah, the city council districts are actually about to change in Philadelphia. What's um, So, so Azania is one of the sponsors for GeoPhilly, and it is um, a software company who specialized in geographic um, data and software applications. So, uh, our, our group built um, Open Data Philly. Okay. We also just released um, the energy benchmarking. Yeah. They built an app for the, for the mayor's office on. Sustainability. sustainability, yeah. And uh, you can kind of play around with the energy bench parking for city owned or operated property. Good. All right. Thank you. So, uh, thanks everybody for coming out. I think we're going to turn it out to uh, City Flash.